Hey there my fellow witches, welcome to the Magical Den channel. If you are a beginner and stepping into the path of paganism, wicca or witchcraft or you're simply being drawn down this path, then you have made it to the right channel where you will find helpful knowledge about the craft, its rituals, tips and tricks. In today's video we will be discussing solitary practice in the Wiccan lifestyle. As the name would imply, solitary practitioners are Wiccans who choose to practice the craft on their own, in their homes, backyards, or out in nature. While some coven members may do spell work on their own, if their coven permits it, this is not the same thing as solitary practice. Though they may occasionally join a circle for a particular Sabbath celebration or other special occasion, the vast majority of a solitary Wiccan spiritual work is done alone, and there are plenty who never commune with others at all. It's estimated that more than half of all Wiccans are solitary practitioners. This trend came about toward the end of the 20th century, when interest in Wicca had become widespread thanks to many published books on the craft. For many would-be practitioners, there wasn't a coven within 500 miles, or if there was, it either wasn't open to new membership, or just wasn't a good fit in terms of personalities. So people began practicing on their own, leaving behind the notion that one could only become a Wiccan through initiation by another Wiccan. Instead, they began to self-initiate and adapt other coven practices for solitary use. Reasons for choosing a solitary path with the explosion of interest in Wicca in the age of the internet, there are now many, many more covens out there in the world than there were just a few decades ago. Nonetheless, there still isn't one in every single community, and again, even if there is one in your area, it may not be open to new members. Even if it is open, it may not be in the tradition you follow, or it may just not be a group you feel right about joining. But lack of access to the coven of one's choice aside, there are several reasons why so many Wiccans choose a solitary path over a group pursuit. For some, it really comes down to practicality. Frankly, it's much easier and more convenient to practice at home. Gardnerian followers appreciate the freedom and comfort of working skyclad for rituals by themselves in their circle, with no prying eyes or inhibitions clouding their work. This also goes for witches who might be self-conscious in their ritual robes if others were to see them. In fact, for many solitaries, there's a lot to be said for the privacy of practicing behind closed doors. It also works for those who have tight schedules and can't commit to the mandatory attendance expected of coven members, especially those with children. You may remember that covens gather for spell work, sabbats, and full moons, and sometimes new moons and special ceremonies. Not everyone can accommodate all of those occasions in addition to attending to the mundane events of life. Solitary practice allows for a when-time-allows approach, and in this fast-paced world, this is a strong selling point for Wiccans who are up to their ears in life. There's also the fact that solitaries can keep their faith entirely secret from the rest of the world, if they wish. Some Wiccans still have a lot of trepidation about identifying publicly with their religion for fear of embarrassment, stigma, or other kinds of repercussions. While covens do practice secrecy, there's still no absolute guarantee that one would never be outed as a witch. For other solitaries, the main attraction is freedom, to explore different traditions, to identify their own beliefs, to practice the kind of magic they want, and to basically just do their own thing. In covens, rituals are usually set in stone, performed exactly according to the tradition's ways. In the solitary experience, rituals and spell work can be much more fluid, with individual changes that would not be permitted in the more orthodox Wiccan traditions. On your own, you can decide for yourself how and where you cast a circle and the tools you use within it, and no one is there to tell you you're doing it incorrectly. This also goes for pantheons and deities. There are a great many practitioners out there who crave the freedom to work the pantheon and or deities they find to be most inspiring and evocative. When work within a coven, you are generally expected to follow their set of deities and their concept of the divine. If you're fortunate enough to belong to a coven or circle that does share the same beliefs and ideas, that's wonderful, but this isn't always the case, and you can't force yourself to believe in something that doesn't feel right. 
Sometimes breaking away from the group is the only way to achieve your personal spiritual goals. Finally, some believe that their energy is much more focused in their work when they do it alone. It might be simply too distracting for practitioners to work with a group, there's a lot of activity going on when a coven performs a ritual or ceremonial magic. Others feel that their personal interests are not addressed by the group, or that the spell work isn't personal because it is a collective effort towards one goal that they don't feel has anything to do with their lives. Service to others and to the greater world is good, but doing magic to affect change in one's own life is important too. Some solitary witches would simply prefer to work alone and focus their energy with laser-like precision on more personal pursuits or causes dear to their own hearts. Solitary practice doesn't have to be a lifelong commitment, though. You can always progress from working alone to joining your energies with like-minded others. However, it can be a great place to start. If you are just beginning, you may find yourself unsure about which specific tradition you'd like to follow. The solitary approach means that you have the teachings and philosophies of several traditions at your fingertips. In fact, many coven members recommend spending time researching and studying on your own before deciding to join with others in your practice, so you start off with a clearer sense of what's right for you. All in all, solitary practice has fewer rules in general. You can make and keep your own book of shadows, practice where and when you please, perform rituals to your liking, cast spells in the manner you feel most powerful, and worship the deities that you feel most at home with. You may not have the fellowship of others, but you are the leader of your own path. Indeed, without the constraints of following a coven's rules and practices, the journey becomes a tailor-made experience. Some considerations for the solitary practitioner, as you've no doubt concluded by now, solitary practice really is a completely different life from that of coven membership. Being on one's own means grappling with and addressing certain aspects of the path in a different way. Here are some of the main elements of solitary practice that can present a challenge, at least at the beginning of the path. Ethical clarity, although there's much more flexibility involved in practicing as a solitary versus as a coven member, this doesn't mean that it's a big free-for-all in terms of how one goes about the business of working magic. Solitary practitioners are just as subject to the main laws of Wicca as any member of a coven, namely, the threefold law and that very important line from the Wiccan read, and it harm none, do what ye will, is generally considered to be the first rule of Wicca, and has often been presented as the only true rule. It means that as long as your actions do no harm to anyone, whether we're talking about spell work or just how you go about your everyday life, then you should do what you want to do. It's against Wiccan principles to work negative magic, of course, but it's also no good to work any kind of manipulative magic, in other words, anything that would interfere with another person's free will. If you think about it, you wouldn't want someone else doing anything to control your life or your actions, so it only makes sense that you shouldn't either. And for Wiccans who may be tempted to break, or even bend, this rule, the threefold law is there to make them think twice. The threefold law, simply put, states that anything that you think, say, and do is sent out into the universe and then comes back at you three times as positively or negatively as the original thought, word, or action. It can be likened to a ripple effect on a pond when a drop of rain hits it. At first, the circular ripples are very small, but they grow and spread out to become hundreds of times bigger than the very first ring. And when they reach the shore, they bounce off it and make their return journey back toward the center. The same is true of how magical intentions operate on the spiritual plane. Understanding the threefold law is crucial to working successful magic without bringing negative consequences into your life. Keeping this ripple metaphor in mind, there's also the need to remember that spell work affects the entire universe, not just the spellcaster or its intended recipient. It may not seem like the spell work of one person could affect people down the street, in the next community, or across the world, but in actuality, one small incantation or knot tied at your altar could potentially have effects on those around you. This is why so many Wiccans use the phrase harm to none when sealing their magical work. 
One potential challenge then, for solitary practitioners, is the ability to think through their spell work through before setting anything in motion that they cannot take back. It's important to be very clear about one's motives and expectations in magical work. This can be difficult when you're wrapped up in emotions or stressed out by a situation and can't discern whether or how to try to solve a problem through magic. Having no one to talk to about it can make the issue all that more challenging. This doesn't mean that coven work is automatically fail-safe in the ethics department, Wiccans can go awry in groups just as easily as on their own, but that the perspectives and experiences of others can help refine one's magical choices. Following tradition while many Wiccans choose the solitary path in order to create their own entirely unique practice, there are plenty others who still wish to follow a specific tradition, whether it be Gardnerian, Alexandrian, or even an offshoot of one of these. Although most existing traditions were by and large built around covens, particularly Gardnerian and Alexandrian Wicca, they can, and have been, adapted for solitary practice. The challenges in doing so are that it can be harder to learn on one's own, even with the best of books, and there are aspects of ritual that don't translate from a group setting to a circle of one. Furthermore, there's bound to be aspects of the practice that just can't be known about unless you're a coven initiate. So solitaries may find themselves having to adapt their individual practice in order to find what works best for them. Adaptation should not be confused with cheating or doing something incorrectly, however. First, it's important to remember that even Gardner adapted his coven's ritual liturgy over time, and Alex Sanders actually made adaptability part of his tradition's philosophy. In many ways, it could be argued that adaptation is part of the tradition of Wicca as a whole. As long as you're following your chosen tradition as faithfully as you can, there's no reason to feel that you're not a true Gardnerian or Alexandrian. Sure, you're a solitary practitioner rather than a coven member, but why should that matter? Avoiding the endless label debates, actually, to be frank, there are plenty of Orthodox coven members who will tell you that it does matter, but they're speaking from their own perspective. Many coveners still believe that it takes an initiated witch to make another witch, at least in their particular tradition. Yet solitary practitioners following these traditions will usually undertake a self-initiation, which they often describe as one of the most sacred and special experiences in their lifetime. The fact is, no one has the authority to decree that one person is a Wiccan, Gardnerian or otherwise, and another is not. It's true that self-initiation is seen as a sort of minimum requirement that one would want to have completed before calling oneself a Wiccan, just as you most likely wouldn't call yourself a Catholic unless you've been converted and baptized into the faith. Nonetheless, there's no one handing out Wiccan certificates to make your solitary practice official. Covens can deny you initiation into their group, and it's their right to do so. But if you're choosing the solitary path, then you probably wouldn't have wanted to join them anyhow. In the grand scheme of things, when it comes to covens versus solitaries or any other perceived point of debate among the huge diversity of Wiccans out there, mutual respect remains the ideal. Don't get embroiled in arguments on the internet if you don't want to get bogged down in negative energy. No matter what path you choose in the Wiccan world, you know who you are, and no one else can tell you differently unless you let them. Thank you so much for listening, always remember that knowledge is power. If you haven't already make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell so you will be notified of the next upcoming video and as always brightest blessings to my fellow witches.